Let's define the characteristic of a ring. The characteristic of a ring R is the smallest positive integer n such that n times x equals 0 for all x and r. So it's the same n multiplied by any element in the ring gives us 0. It's possible, in fact fairly likely, that no such integer exists and then we say that the ring has characteristic zero. And just in general, we'll say that the characteristic of ring R will note by CHAR of R. So let's first of all start with one where the characteristic is zero. The characteristic of the integers is zero. And that's pretty clear you take any element, any non-zero element of the integers, it doesn't matter how many times we add it together to itself, you're always just getting bigger and bigger things, you're never going to get zero. Okay, but well now let's look at z6. The characteristic of z6 is equal to 6. So, why is that? Well, certainly 6 times 0 is giving us 0. 6 times 1 is equal to 0. 6 times 2 equals 0. 6 times 3 equals 0. 6 times 4 equals 0. 6 times 5 equals 0. Since, of course, all these multiplications are mod 6. At the same time, it can't be anything smaller than that. Certainly for individual elements it could be smaller. 3 times 2 is equal to 0, but 3 times 1 gives us 3. It has to be the same integer that works for all elements of the ring. And specifically, anything less than 6, when I multiply it times 1, is going to give me that number instead of 0. So 6 is the smallest one for which it works. One more example, let's look at the set 0, 2, 4, 6, where again addition and multiplication are both done mod 8. In this case, the characteristic of that group ring is 4. Similar kind of thing, 4 times 0 is of course equal to 0. 4 times 2 is 8, which mod 8 is 0. 4 times 4 is 16, mod 8 is 0. And 4 times 6 is 24, mod 8 is 0. Again, nothing lower than 4 would work, specifically because of 2. There's no smaller number than 4 that you can multiply 2 by to get 0. Now let's prove a little theorem about this. So as we have a ring that has a unity. So both of these up here would be it, but it wouldn't apply to this one here because that doesn't have a unity. If one has infinite order, then the characteristic of that ring is zero. But if it has a finite order for one, then the characteristic of the ring is just that characteristic. So there's kind of two things to prove here. So Part 1, suppose 1 has infinite order, well if we go back to our definition, the characteristic has to work for all x and r, and by saying that 1 has infinite order, that means that there is no integer that works for that. So right away, that means that the characteristic of R is zero, nothing to it. Okay, part two is a little bit more complicated. Suppose that one has order n under addition. So that means that n times one has to equal zero and no smaller number would work. Now right away, because that's the smallest integer that works for 1, that means that the characteristic of the ring 
is greater than or equal to n. It can't be anything smaller. It could be something bigger. But if I can show that n works for any other element, then it has to be it for the whole ring. Okay, so let's say I, that a is in my ring. So let's think about what is n times a. Well, by definition, n times a is a plus a plus, where there's n copies there. I can go ahead and write that as 1 times a plus 1 times a. Again, there's still n copies. And then, by doing a distribution thing, I can say I've got 1 plus 1 plus n copies of 1 times a, but that n copies of 1 has to be 0, so there we are. The characteristic of r, that is a number n such that any element of this thing, when I take n times that thing, gives me 0. The characteristic had to be at least that, because that was the smallest number for 1. So, the characteristic of r would have to equal n. Let's show one more theorem regarding the characteristic. If I have an integral domain, the characteristic is either 0 or a prime number. So, it couldn't be, like over here, where I said the characteristic of z6 is 6, if it was an ideal domain, which of course z6 isn't, the characteristic of an ideal domain has to be either 0 or prime. I'm actually going to use that last theorem that we proved here. If it's an ideal domain, it's a ring with unity, so all I need to really look at is figure out the order of 1. If I know what the order of 1 is, I know what the order of the entire ideal domain is. Okay, so the characteristic of an ideal domain. So let's consider that, let's say that n is the order of 1. Because of the previous theorem, that's also going to be the characteristic of R. And let's suppose that N is equal to the product of two other numbers, S times T. <coughs> then we know, since N is the order of 1, we know that 0 has to equal N times 1 which means that we've got s times t times 1. But that's the same thing as s times 1 times t times 1. And now let's think about this. What we have here is that this element times this element equals 0. But we're in an integral domain, which means that we don't have any 0 divisors. Since we don't have any zero divisors, that either means that s times 1 could equal 0, or t times 1 would have to equal 0. One of those two things has to be true. But hold on. n was the smallest possible number, such that when you take it times 1, you get 0. So, the only possibility here is that either s is equal to n or t equals n. Because these things have to be less than n to be divisors, and they multiply together and give us 0. OK, but hold on. What we basically said is that if n is the product of two numbers, one of those numbers has to be the n itself, which is exactly what it means for n to be prime. 
So there we go. If we have an integral domain and we had a finite order, not that infinite zero order characteristic, then n had to be prime.